Daniel. Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, and turned and passed on, and went down to Gilgal. And, and Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord, I have performed the commandments of the Lord. Okay, um, so God is sending Samuel there to discipline Saul. What do you think is going through Saul's mind as he's oh. having to go? Here he is again. <laughs> if I gaslight enough, I can get away scot-free. That would be what Saul would think. Yeah. Um, I'm sure he hoped to see a repentant Saul. <laughs> but no, <laughs> Saul built a monument to himself. Um, but it wouldn't have been a monument with a statue of himself because that is over and above what Jews are allowed. Jews were not to make images of things. We remember they did. They made the golden calf and they got in a lot of trouble for that. But they are so against making images of any living thing. So it wouldn't have been a statue of Saul. It was probably more what's called a, a steel, a steel, steel. Think Washington Monument. That was the kind of monuments that were typical around that time. So um, it was probably something like that. Um, Steely. I looked up the what it, how to pronounce it. Um, it's also possible that this was in the shape of a hand. That was very common monument because the hand signified power. And he was, he was showing he had power. So it doesn't specify exactly what it was, but it wouldn't have been a statue of himself. Or that would have been a whole lot of big can of worms opened up. Um, so he had made a me monument. Do you have any me monuments at your house? Where you put up things and look and say, oh, look how good I was. For a movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I gotta a say, I, I've, I've had, I've had me monuments, but I don't have room for me monuments anymore. <laughs> so the certificates and things like that—they're gone. Yes, I don't need those anymore. Um, so Saul has the nerve to say, "Look what a good boy I am. Look, I, I'm good, aren't I, God? Samuel, aren't you proud of me?" Um, he's so self-deceived, he doesn't see his sin. So, let's see how, how God is going to react to that. Verse 14 through 16. But Samuel said, What then is this beating of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, The soldiers brought them from the Amalekites, and they spared the best of the sheep and cattle, to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. <laughs> Stop, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. <laughs> tell me, Saul replied. <laughs> okay, so so Samuel, and by the way, did you notice last week Pastor messed up Samuel and Saul a lot too? <laughs> it's not just me. Um, so Samuel basically says, Okay, if you destroyed any everything, how, what is that, what's that sound? <laughs> oh, yeah. Sheep are not quiet animals. Look, <laughs> they are. They make noise, and 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 they smell. They have a unique smell. They do not smell like cattle. Neither one of them smell that great. They have a unique smell. So, I mean, there's evidence right there. Um, so Samuel could hear and smell and he could probably see these livestock that were supposed to be dead. Um, it's kind of hard to hide your sin when it's there bleeding and making noise. When we're prideful, that can ma make us oblivious to our sin. And he is, he's having a pride, problem with pride. What was completely obvious to Samuel was Saul didn't see. 
No, Saul didn't see his sin at all. So he said the soldiers bought him. Yeah, yeah, that's... Um, I almost brought a little thing that said, had a, a buck on it so you, we could pass the buck every time, so, every time Saul passes the buck. Um, eventually, our sin is going to move or it's going to bleed. It's going to come out. It, our sin doesn't stay hidden. So he starts with the excuses. Um, if your version says the people did it, it means the soldiers. Every time he says the people, it's the soldiers. Um, they did it, but they only kept the best. And and they did it for a, a noble reason. They're gonna, they wanted to sacrifice the best to you. Did God say, keep the best and sacrifice it to him? Nope. The sacrifice was to kill them where they found them. And then he still insists that he completely obeyed. It was the soldiers. Notice how he, how smoothly he shifts between them and us and me. It's not him, it's them. Even if it was them, he is their leader. He didn't say, oh, no, you shouldn't have done that. Go kill him. Well, in the verse 8, it says he took the king. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're following his example. No. He's the one that started it by keeping the king alive. So they're saying, well, he's disobeying. Let's disobey too. Let's keep the good stuff. And whether they really meant to sacrifice it or not, it doesn't say here. I suspect they didn't plan on sacrificing it, but now they're caught. So now they got to shift stories. But God doesn't want what he told him not to. <laughs> he told him not. Yeah, he doesn't want that sacrifice. No. It was to be a burnt offering when they conquered the people. They were supposed to be all burned up already. Um, his real problem is Saul does not have a good relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Um in the sermon today, Pastor's gonna be preaching out of first Samuel ten where he the Holy Spirit has filled him, and, and he's prophesying, and he's all great with God. But then, now he has fallen so far away from that. Um, and notice in verse 15, who are they sacrificing, does Saul say they're sacrificing to? Your God. What says your God? <laughs> he's, and he's talked to Saul, so he's saying... They're going to sacrifice to God, to your God, not my God, not our God. Sacrificing to uh, pride is moving right in on that throne and taking over everything. Um, and look, and in verse fifteen it says the people or the soldiers brought the animals. But we were going to sacrifice them. So anytime it was something bad, it was the people. If it was something that Saul thought was good, it was we or me. Um, this was modern day. Saul would be diagnosed with narcissism. <laughs> yeah. Um, and because Saul did not kill Agag, the king, they are going to be affected for centuries, um, Agag Ag, and all the people. When they were under the Persian captivity, the Persian king married a Jewess named Esther. And their enemy ends up being um, Hagar. Is that the right name? Who was a descendant of Agag. Ag. If they had killed Haman. 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 Yeah, I knew it was some Hagar's. Uh, yeah, Hagar's didn't the lady. <laughs> yeah, Hagar. Hey, I was saying that's that's a woman's name. Um, Haman. So, if they had killed him, if Saul had killed him and all the, all of the Malachites at that time, there wouldn't have been a story of Esther, because there wouldn't have been a bad guy. But God's plan. Yeah, God. God knew it was going to happen the whole time. Um. 
And later, when Saul is killed in battle, the last thrust is by a guy that is an Amalekite. He wouldn't have been there if they had obeyed the law. When we don't obey God completely, trouble's going to come back and bite us. So Samuel's had enough of this. He's heard enough, and he says, Stop! You, you could almost hear him say, Shut up! Yeah. Just <laughs> shut up! You're digging a bigger hole for yourself. Um, I wonder what the message says there. <laughs> yeah, it would be interesting to see what the message says. Um, so Samuel now has a word from God for Saul. Saul is probably thinking, Oh, this is going to be good, but he should be able to judge by Samuel's attitude. It's not going to be good. Um, but still, Saul has to have that last word. He says, okay, go ahead and talk. I mean, the king is giving the prophet permission to talk. No king has that power to tell a prophet to talk or not talk. <laughs> the prophet is from God, and if God tells him to speak, even if the king says don't speak, he better speak, because <laughs> God is telling him to. Um, we'll see it over and over again um, that prophets get in trouble with the kings because when they are speaking the truth because it's usually not really nice to the king. So they get in trouble over and over again. But if they disobey and don't speak God's word, <laughs> they're in trouble up there, which is a worse place to be in trouble. So um, Saul giving Samuel permission means nothing. But he likes that last word. Okay, verse 17 through 21. And Samuel said, Though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go devote the destruction of the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you uh, pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of of the things devoted to the destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. <laughs> He's confusing. In one, in one thing he's saying, I obeyed you, <clears throat> and I saved the king. That is like... You missed the point. <laughs> yeah, Samuel just said, you're to destroy everything. But here's the king. Well, yeah, I saved him. Isn't that great? I saved him. So we can sacrifice him to you. He he just doesn't get it. Um, it starts off saying when you were little, or your your version may say though you are little. It's referring to when he when Saul first became king. Remember the guy that hid in the luggage. Yeah. Um, when you were not full of pride, when your ego wasn't so big. It, that's when it's referring to when. Um, and at that time, he ruled a nation. Now, he's big in his own eyes. And God is going to take that nation away from him. Um, you remember when he gave that, that command about destroying everything? Was there any question about what he was supposed to do? But he's interpreted it a whole different way. For his own good. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, he he pleads his innocence. You know to, you notice it's, he's shifting blame all over the. Uh, he's passing that back over and over and over again. He's in, in the same sense. He's saying I obeyed, but I and I did this. No, that's not obedience. Um, he needs to go back and rethink exactly what God had commanded because this is not it. Um, he says, he has to go on and say, I completely destroyed the Amalekites. But 
they're standing right here. The people, the animals. Um, and again, it, we never see that the people are saved. But we see their descendants. So the people are saved. <laughs> there are people that are saved. They probably saved the best of them. Um, How do you decide who's the best? They had their... Probably the, the richer ones, the and, and the best the, looking ones. Yeah. Like without blemish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What and, they what they would term as and, and and doesn't that remind you of what's going on today? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're they're told what to do and yet the rest of the world is telling them that that's wrong. You can't do that. You can't do that. Yep. Um, so Saul has been telling half truth. A half truth equals a whole lie. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. There are no half truths. That's it's true. true that the people, the people are the ones that took the plunder. That we saw that, but they're only following the example of their leader, and they doing like their leader said. Okay, uh, verse 22 and 23. So Samuel said, Has the Lord of great, has the Lord of great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? As in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than the sacrifice, and to heed them fat rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. <laughs> because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Okay, so that, that section there that looks like a psalm, it does it look written differently than everything else? Mm -hmm. That usually designates it's, it's a word from the Lord. So this is a message that God has for Saul. Um, and one of, one of the phrases that we see today a lot, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. In fact, Keith Green wrote a great song on that. It's saying religious rites, re doing, doing religious service, all that means nothing. If your heart, if it, God doesn't have your heart, he doesn't want us to just do things he wants us to do them because we love him he wants us to give because we love him even things like tithing he wants us to have a cheerful heart and we have if we don't have a cheerful heart he doesn't want it he wants us to love him and obey him um this theme is repeated in Psalms and Proverbs and Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Micah, Matthew, Mark, and Hebrews. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's an important thing if, it, if God repeats it a lot. He's not saying that sacrifice is not important, but the motive behind it is important. You can make a you can make a thousand sacrifices to God and, and work a thousand hours and just sacrifice so many things, give millions of dollars, but without your heart, you know, it, it's a waste. D.L. Moody, um, in the D.L. Moody handbook, it says, I'm going to read this. Did you ever notice all but the heart of man obeys God? If you look through history, you will find that this is true. In the beginning, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Let the waters bring forth, and the water brought forth abundantly. And one of the proofs, proofs that Jesus Christ is God is that he brought, he spoke to nature, and nature obeyed him. At one time, he spoke to the sea, and the sea recognized and obeyed. He spoke to the fig tree, and instantly it withered and died. It obeyed literally and at once. He spoke to devils, and the devils fled. He spoke to the grave, and the grave obeyed him and gave back its dead. But when he speaks to man, man will not obey him. That is why man is out of harmony with God, and it will never be different until men learn to obey God. 
God wants obedience and he will have it, else there will be no harmony. So, religious observance, not Saul's problem. But his heart is in the right place. Um, Basically, it's all about the relationship. Yeah. So if you have a relationship with him, you hear his voice. Yeah. So and it's you all about it. the relationship. That's, yeah. And that's your heart. <laughs> it's a heart relationship. Yeah. And, and it would be easy for Saul to point around and say, look at those heathen Philistines, those heathen Amalekites, and look how good I am compared to them. You know, look at the look at those pagan people out in the community, out in the world, and I'm so much better. Mm -hmm. We're not. God wants our heart. So by having these empty practices, Saul is rejecting God again. He's rejected God before. He's continuing to reject God. So God rejects him again. There's people that would say, well, Saul, God's being pretty tough on Saul. There's going to be a lot worse kings. There, there are going to be really bad kings coming along. And God doesn't reject them. But Saul is the first king. And God knows Saul's heart. And um, he doesn't want that heart ruling Israel. And he says, and again, it's going to be a while before God takes him out of the being king. But he's talking more about the dynasty. Your kids are not going to be king. Your dynasty is going to die with you. It's going to be another 25 years before Saul dies. So, And he's king through all that. God is working in his time. <laughs> Everyone else is probably going, I thought you were going to get rid of this king. Why haven't you done that? 25 years later, don't get rid of that king. Okay, verse 24 and 25. That's going to be one of you two. Is it me? Oh, okay. <laughs> Saul, Saul answered Samuel, I have sinned. I have transgressed the Lord's command and your word. Because I was afraid of the people, I obeyed them. Now, therefore, please forgive my sin and return with me, with me so I can worship the Lord. Oh, that's it. That's it. Okay. Sounds, starts off sounding like a really good repentance. Sounds like he's serious. If he just stopped. <laughs> if he said, Lord, I have sinned. But then he gave because. <laughs> and not God. There, there is no because after a repentance. I have sinned. There's no justifying sin. Yeah, no justifying <laughs> He, sound, he sounds like a little boy caught with his hand in the cookie jar. Only admitting it because he got caught. Uh, and he's refusing to take personal responsibility again. He only did this because the people. He was afraid of the, He's a king. He obeyed their he voice. Has all the power. He, I don't know if he had the power to say off with their head or, you know, but he's afraid. Mm -hmm. He says he's afraid of them. Um, so he, he he decides, okay, we need to go to God. So you, you can ask God to fix it all. Because God can fix it all. Um, but it's still no true repentance. God can fix it all. He will fix it all in his way. But he wants repentance from us. Um and and he doesn't ask Saul. <clears throat> he doesn't ask Samuel <laughs> to go with him before God. He commands it. He's pulling his king thing. You don't command the prophet to do things. But he's commanding. The words in Hebrew are, are commanding words. Um, and he's concerned about his image. He wants the people to see Samuel supporting him again. Because it's that pride thing. If Samuel's supporting him, that means God is still with him. 
problem is God is not. Okay, this is a chunk, verse 26 through 29. It's not that big of a chunk. Oh, I'm sorry, through 31. Oh, yeah, bigger <laughs> chunk, bigger chunk. <laughs> and Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the skirt of his robe, and it tore. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day, and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me that I may bow before the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul bowed before the Lord. Okay, so some confusing things kind of going in here. He starts off saying, I'm not going with you. And as he's leaving, Saul tears Samuel's robe, and then he does go back with him. So what's going on here? Um, at first he says, it, it, he's not going to go with him to the sacrifice. One night, one thought may be, what animals are they going to sacrifice? The ones, the ones that shouldn't be there at all? <laughs> and... <laughs> Samuel doesn't want any part of that. Um, so Samuel says what needs to be said, and he's done, and he's he's leaving. And so Saul is desperate. You can't lose the prophet because you lose God. You lose the image. He's worried about his image. So he grabs his robe, and he tears it. So immediate object lesson. Isn't it great to have, be able to associate things with, <laughs> with things that happen right then and there? So, this torn piece of robe symbolizes what is going to happen to Saul's kingdom. It's going to be torn from him. Saul makes it clear there is no way out of this. You, God said. This is the third time. You are not going to be king. Um, and another shot to his pride. They're going to new king, and he's going to be so much better than you. So what do you think that's doing to Saul's pride? Um, and again, he says, your God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again. He, he had... Mm -hmm. Yes, and accepted God as his God. And that, that goes back to that relationship thing. He's got to be your God, got to be my God, or I don't have a relationship at all. Um, so again, he commands Samuel to come with him and sacrifice, or come with him. Well, and he confesses again, but it's still not a true repentance. Um, he's only concerned about what the people are going to think of him and so God has already raised up the replacement he's sitting out there um, but not having a king until God is done developing the new king that would create anarchy so God is leaving Saul in place until he has David ready to go. In case you didn't know, David's the next king. I think we all know that. Um, so he goes with Saul because the kingship for now needs to continue. And the people would probably reject Saul if Samuel rejected him completely. Did going before God do any good for Saul? doesn't change a thing. He's still losing his kingdom. He may have looked better in front of the people. Um, it's, and it seems like maybe his heart moved a little, but it's just temporary. It's, it's going to move back again. But there is still one problem hanging around. Named Agag. Who is supposed to be dead. So... Samuel can't let that go by. Verse 32 and 33. Betty? Okay. Mm -hmm. and 32 and 33. Okay. Then Samuel said, Bring me Agag, 
king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. And Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag to pieces before the Lord at Gilgal. Did you ever picture Samuel this way? <laughs> I, I think we probably think of prophets as being peaceful, mild-mannered. <laughs> nope. And how does, when they call Agag, how does he come? Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> he thinks he's dodged the bullet. He thinks, yay. Yeah, really good king. Most of his people are probably killed. And he doesn't have a kingdom to rule over, but he's overjoyed because he's alive for now. He thinks he's going to stay alive. Um, Saul makes it clear. No, Samuel. I even wrote it wrong. Samuel makes it clear that Agag is not an innocent bystander. That his people were not innocent. That they they were a wicked people. They had, um, if you remember back why they were originally, God said, we're going to wipe these guys out, is because when the Israelites were wandering through the wilderness, the Amalekites would keep attacking them at their weakest spot with the women and children, mercilessly. And, and, they would have wiped all the Israelites out if they could. And God said, they are an evil, wicked people. And they, besides they worship idols. And, and we've talked about before, the way they worshiped idols was not a nice way at all. So they were evil. So these people deserve to be taken away. And they, they were enemies of Israel. Um, so... Again, up till now, everything we've seen about Samuel, he's been a pretty peaceful guy. But God has, has told him what needs to be done. And he picks up a sword and he hacks him to death. <laughs> it's like, whoa. I don't know what everybody else is thinking about around there. but And it's not just a stress where oh, it just yeah. starts. Yeah, it says, yeah. Yeah, mine says, hacked him to pieces. Mm -hmm. Not a fun way to die. Yeah. And notice who he did it before in verse 33. Before the Lord. He didn't do it before the people. Didn't do it before Saul. He did it before the Lord. He was doing what the Lord commanded for the Lord. Everybody else is just bystanders. Okay, verse 34 and 35. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house of Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Okay, so Samuel is out of Saul's life. Yeah. When it says he didn't see him, he will see him on the day he dies. But he won't see him until then. They live 10 miles apart from each other. And they, they will not see each other. I'm sure Saul would want to see Samuel, but Samuel, he's done. Um, so when it says, and, so, and the Lord regretted that he made Saul king over Israel. Does that mean God thinks he made a mistake? No. 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 <laughs> Grieved. Yeah, I think grieved is a better word for it. Um, he hurt for Saul. He had seen the potential of Saul. Even though he knew, he of course knew what was going to happen. But he saw potential. And that man did not live up to his potential at all. So that made God sad. I think it makes God sad when we don't live up to our potential. Um, he wants us. He wants the best for us. And sometimes that may be a hard road, but at the end of the road, we're better. 
And if we take shortcuts and bypass the road, it grieves him. Not that he made a mistake. But he wants the best. Okay, First Samuel 16, new chapter. Um, so, from this chapter to the end of First Samuel is about 15 years. Um, and 15 years with two main characters, David and Saul. We're going to see other people in there, but the focus on David and Saul. Verse 1 through 3. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. For I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Okay, so there is a time to mourn. And then there's a time to move on. And God is saying, okay, the mourning's over. He didn't say it was wrong for him to mourn. But now it's time. Time to continue with his plan. And so he says, get your, get your oil. So that must have really excited Samuel. Because getting his oil means he's going to go anoint someone. So something fun. Yay. For once. Um, so Saul had turned into a failure, but man's failures don't change God's plans. God will, I, we had a Sunday school director that would always say, there's a stump in the road, you plow around it. So he's plowing around Saul. Um, God is even telling Samuel exactly where he's going to find the next king. And an important thing to notice, the first king, who who chose that king? It was the people. Or God was involved in the choosing, but it was for the people. What the people wanted. And a pastor kind of points that out when he preaches about it. This king is going to be God's choice. And he's not going to be the one that people would choose. We're going to see even Samuel doesn't get it right. Um, and so he sends him to Jesse. Now Jesse is the grandson of Ruth and Boaz. So they're back in the story. I, they're probably dead and gone by now. But he probably Jesse probably grew up hearing stories about Jericho and um, and exciting things about God. So Saul Saul is in Bethlehem or Saul is his city is only about 10 miles away from where Jesse lives. So Saul Samuel's kind of concerned that Saul's going to hear about this and he's not going to be happy. Hmm. Um, Saul is kind of showing some signs of instability and if Saul hears about it he's probably going to think it's treason so um, it's, it's a valid concern but Samuel is God's prophet so it's a little surprising that he's afraid but, he's, but it shows he's a man He's not a spiritual being. He's a man. He still has human fears. So God gives him a plan. It's not a lie. He is going to go sacrifice. So, but it will not reveal his, all the purpose of why he's going. So he's going to take a heifer. Now, a heifer would never be used for a burnt offering or a sin offering. But it could be used for a peace offering. So he's going to give a peace offering. 
Um, so God is working all this. You know, even if Saul is there doing all these things that aren't godly, God is still in control. Um, they, Israel could recognize God and, and benefit from it or reap the consequences. Saul is reaping the consequences. Verse 4 and 5. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived in Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled. When they met him, they asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourself and then come to the sacrifice with me. Then, the, then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Okay, so they ask, they see Saul, Samuel, and they say, are you, are you coming in peace? Why would they, why would they say that? You just have to keep it. You just have to keep <laughs> They probably heard about that. Um, this guy that they thought was really peaceful and everything just got right back to person. Um, the other thing is, he's a straight shooter. He's speaking of God, about, from God. And they may be thinking, is he coming to speak against us um, or for us? People don't like to hear about their sin. But he tells them, I'm, I've come in peace. I'm not, not going to hack anybody. Yeah. They probably hid their swords anyway. But, um, and he says, I've come here to sacrifice. Um, and he invites them. He invites especially Jesse and his sons to the sacrifice. Um. And with this kind of peace offering, they wouldn't just sacrifice. They would have a feast afterward. So he's inviting Jesse and his sons to be the guests of honor at this feast. Probably the whole town comes because at this time, Bethlehem is not a, well, never gets to be a huge town, but it's not a big town. Um, so he wants everyone to prepare their hearts for their sacrifice. Um And remember, in a peace offering, part of the animal is sacrificed, burnt, and given to the Lord. And the other part, you have a feast. So that's what they're getting ready to do. You okay with reading? Or? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay, verse 6 through 10. And it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked upon Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh in on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. Okay, so Samuel fell in the appearance trap too. Eliab, apparently tall and good looking, he says, Oh, he looks like king material. That, it must be him. And God says, Uh-uh, not him. And as each of the sons by, come by, hmm, not him. God is looking at the heart. And he still looks at the heart, not at the appearance. Um, for for the majority of us, isn't that good news? <laughs> um, it also means we can't read other people's hearts like God can. We may look at a person and and judge them, and that may not be their heart at all. But God knows their heart. So Jesse prays his sons and. God rejects every single one of them through Samuel. And imagine what Samuel's thinking as each one of these go by. Got it? Then? Then? We're running out of kids here. You know, what's going on, God? Um, 
maybe he's wondering if he heard God right. Is this really what I'm supposed to do? Because you know, these kids aren't working out. And it's not that these sons are bad. They're not the chosen one. Um, God knows who he's chosen. And he'll point it out. Verse 11. I think I get one verse. Verse 11 says, Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest. But behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes. So, so they're holding up the whole feast thing here. Everybody's hungry. The meat's getting cold. Um, but there's a problem. You know, a problem. He's run out of kids. You know, and so Samuel says, "Got any more hanging out there?" And Dad says, "Oh yeah, I I do. <laughs> I got I got the my the baby youngest. The yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, the thing is." Shepherding was, shepherds were not an honored group. Um, they, David is different, but it was usually given to your servant to do. It was not a pleasant job to do. Um, you know, dad doesn't even mention the name. It's, it's like, yeah, it's a kid out there. Um. It's not necessarily because something's wrong with David, but when you have so many sons, it's easy to forget the youngest. Oh, yeah, him. Um, it's usually the oldest that gets picked on things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here he yeah, is babies. The baby. <laughs> yeah, because if you think that, he was the youngest, but well, not next to the youngest, but he was the favorite. Baby. Yeah. Yeah. But yet he was sent out to find his brothers. So there's a little bit of it. Yeah. Um, but the idea here is that dad didn't respect David much. Um, so we learn that David's taking care of the sheep and, and um, he is called for this parade while he's keeping sheep. He's faithfully doing what his father told him to do. And we'll see over and over, he does it. He does it with all his might and strength. Um, so his the fact that he's taking care of the sheep shows that his family's not a wealthy family because if they were wealthy, they would have servants doing that. Um, so the job of a shepherd, early morning, lead that flock out to the fields, um, pasture them, watch over them all day, protect them. If any stray, go go get that stray back in. Make sure they get water, lead them to water. Um, and that night, take them back to the fold and count them as they're coming back in. Make sure you got them all. And then guard them against animals and thieves. So he does that. So he's doing this job that is considered lowly. And this is going to be their king. Way different thing than Saul. So keeping sheep. Watching them while they graze. He has a lot of time to think. Because they, they will just stay put and graze. Um, it's out of nature. Seeing God's creation. God is already working in him. He's building him a heart to sing about his creation, sing about his glories, have a relationship with him unlike any other. Um, and being a shepherd, you had to be a good shepherd. You had to care about those sheep. It had to be more of a, more than just a job. Um, and it also meant you had to trust God in the midst of danger. Because we're gonna we're gonna see later, David ran into a lot of danger while he was keeping those sheep, but he completely trusted God. He had to keep those sheep safe from lions, and bears and wolves. And yes, at that time they had what was called a Syrian bear in in Israel. 
So he protected against those. They, they were considered fiercer than lions. So he had, he had to protect them against those. And all his time out there with those sheep was not wasting God time at all. God was preparing him. And David will never lose his shepherd's heart. So that seems like a really good place to end. We will pick up on verse 12 next week. And I will end this.